Hi everybody, I'm Viraj. Uh, first, I'd like to thank the folks at Ramp and the folks at Firstmark for the space and hosting us and putting this event together and inviting me. Uh, yeah, so I'm Viraj. I'm the CTO and co-founder of Tensor Zero. I uh, originally, I got a PhD at CMU in robotics over the last few years, and I was working on reinforcement learning for nuclear fusion and then for LLMs and the systems that go with them. I've been working in machine learning research for a very long time before that though. And my co-founder Gabriel and I, we started to build Tensor Zero because every time we thought about language model applications, there was this desired quality where if you run your language model application, you should build up a data set of historical information about that application that allows you to make your application better the next time. And over time, that would build a compounding asset that would be valuable to your business and eventually would become defensible. So Tensor Zero, as a business, we build open source infrastructure that allows you to build LLM systems with this quality. And uh, right now it's fully open source, so I hope you guys check it out on GitHub and try it. Um, and let's jump in. So uh, I wanna talk about what it takes to build a production quality LLM application. You might start, and we'll use the application here of an AI SDR that's writing emails that are you know, intended to drive clicks and opens, and then eventually maybe meetings and conversions. And so when you do that, you would ideally like your LLM generations to eventually get better at driving those things because that's what matters to your business. So to set that up, you might originally first play with a prompt and a model. You, uh, you know, may try many prompts, iterate with that, write a couple of test cases, see how it does. Then take those test cases, try many different model providers, build some observability, put in a gateway, put in a bunch of other tools. After a while, you might collect data in your observability. You might want to use that to fine tune a model and do better next time. Once you're in production, you're observing that model, you're trying different prompts, you need a way to manage the different experiments you run. There's a lot of complexity that goes into this, is what I'm saying. Eventually, you might try inference strategies. There's a lot going on. And there are a number of point solutions that help you handle each of those cases. So you may have like an observability tool, you may use a fine tuning API, you may uh, try a RLHF with some provider, you might use OpenAI's 01 for inference time optimizations, et cetera. But those things don't really play nicely together. And uh, you know, here at Tensor Zero, we hope to build infrastructure that solves that problem in a free way, where you can keep that data in a database that you control and use that to drive these optimizations in general for your company. And so what we're building here at Tensor Zero is a learning flywheel that unifies machine learning operations. So you integrate with one API as a gateway, where it connects with every major LLM provider as well as the open source serving frameworks. When you're using that provider in production, that gateway in production, it dumps structured logs in a form that allows you to provide many different kinds of optimizations. So you might optimize your prompts with something like DSPy. You might fine tune open or closed source models using APIs or open source fine tuning frameworks. You might do reinforcement learning. You might spend some more extra tokens at inference time to do inference time optimizations to improve your systems. All of that comes out of the same database and the same data model. So you don't have to worry about doing ETL or duct taping tools together or switching around and you can try things really quickly. And then critically for Tensor Zero, uh, once you have a new implementation, you might have a new model you've fine tuned or a new prompt that you've developed, you, you don't wanna change your whole client to be able to do that thing. You'd ideally wanna be able to like shift over 3% of your traffic to that and see how it's doing in production and understand like, is it driving conversions or is it driving opens? And so uh, we think about this as a distinction between the interface and the implementation. So you might think of a language model call as a remote procedure call where you send business variables to a gateway and then eventually you get back business variables and whatever happens in the middle is an implementation detail. Meaning that if you're using GBT4 with prompt A or Claude with prompt B or some other complicated strategy with prompt C, you eventually get the same interface for your client code and you can see which one of those things works best in practice. And uh, you know that pipes right back into the inference gateway allowing you to basically say, okay, I've fine tuned something, I've evaluated it, I wanna put it in prod and let's see how it goes. And all of that happens within one framework that you run in open source on your systems. So there's no lock-in in that sense. I wanna to, I want to show you something that I've been really excited about lately. Now, as a reinforcement learning guy, you always read these language model papers and they come with tables. Tables meaning that there's a static level of performance that you've achieved by like pre-training and then post-training your language model. And I find that a little sad because reinforcement learning papers, you always see this nice curve that goes up and to the right. 
and you see a model that gets better in real time as it you know, accumulates experience and learns from it. And we don't really see that with language models today. So I want to show you just a really simple example of how TensorZero 0 unlocks this and it happens in real time. So this problem is really simple named entity recognition problem on a standard academic data set. So it actually is like more like a supervised learning problem. But really like the point that I'm, I would like to make with this example is that there's some ambiguity in what the correct answer is here. If you'll, you'll notice uh, the organization that it pulled out of the text is New York City's Columbia University. New York City's a location, Columbia's an, an, org you know, an organization, there's some ambiguity in how this was labeled. If the house rule is that that's an organization, then you have to figure out how to you know, get, that, get your model to behave the way you want. And that's not, not entirely obvious. So I wanted to show you, you guys see sweet. So we basically here have set up a pipeline where there's a, you see the y-axis of this chart is the similarity with the ground truth data, so you want that to go up. And then here are two lines basically where the blue one is GPT-40 mini with a standard prompt. And then the orange line is dynamic in context learning. So what's happening here is we're giving feedback to the model on which, uh, which examples are correct and which examples are incorrect and using that to actually inform a vector store. So put each model into a vector database and embed it and then retrieve the most similar good examples at inference time. And so as I'm talking right now, this system is actually improving and learning how to get better at this named entity recognition task using the labels that it's getting. And so this is obviously a really simple toy example that we, you know, we're doing so that you guys can read and see, but this actually works for a really general mixture of problems where you might be able to try that on <clears throat> your own, you know, AI SDR application or your own, your product manager might want to make annotations about what is good and bad behavior. And the same type of thing is possible to unlock. And uh, you can do this like very, very quickly without having to retrain a model. Of course, if you have the budget and the time and the data to, to retrain a model, you can also do that through TensorZero or otherwise, and you'll get much better performance from that. So we, you know, there's a kind of a take that this is a very dynamic system. You have many possible tools you can use, and the appropriate tool <clears throat> is dependent on your budget, uh, how much data you have, and like also dynamic as the field changes. And we wanna enable that uh, with TensorZero. So I think that that kind of put, points me at like the takeaway that I care about in this talk, which is that there, the answer is like not obvious in any LLM question. When you ask me like, what is theoretically the right way to like make my model work better? There's always a lot of things to try. And I think the takeaway here is that you should be empirical, agnostic, extensible about how you try your LLM, how do you try to improve your LLM systems? So you might wanna work on the prompt if you have very few examples. Over time, if you accumulate more data or a new fine tuning technique comes out or a new open source model is released or you know, they let us fine tune 3.5 Sonnet, you might look at like actually updating the model weights. And then you know, as we saw with 01, there's a lot to unlock with inference time compute as well. And so you saw dynamic in context learning today, but um, you know, there are a number of techniques in the literature, some of which we already support, some of which they're on our roadmap to allow you to again, leverage this data to do better. I want to talk for a little bit about why this is an important problem and like what you should take away about the future of machine learning, even as the models get stronger. <clears throat> I think the takeaway here is that if you took like a smart person in the audience and had them do a totally new job, like write insurance claims that Kaiser will accept for medical bills, you're not going to be perfect at that the first day. No matter how much you've been pre-trained, how smart you are, where you went to school, etc., you're going to have to learn from the experience of like getting the feedback from those claims and learning what works. And I think this will remain true even in a future where we have much bigger models and much smarter, you know, much better post-training, et cetera. And I think building towards a future where we can enable this kind of feedback is like critically important and doing it in a way where the data remains in a format that you can use on your own compute is an asset for your organization. So I think that's one major takeaway. The other takeaway is that supervision should be in the form of consequences. Like, of course, it's very nice to be able to say, this is the exact inference that I would have liked you to do for this particular call to a language model. But you also, you know, we don't really specify things that way in general. We mostly talk about, you know, accomplish this goal, you know, make the conversion, make the sale. We don't tell our salespeople what to say. We say like, we, we want you to sell more stuff. And so I think that form of supervision will be much more critical in a world where many, many inferences lead to a, con a consequence. And we're not able to say, oh, inference number 436 was bad because of this reason. And so I think TensorZero is built for that vision from the ground up. It's open source, it's free. You should try it. Um, so if you have any questions about that, feel free to reach out to me at that email. 
If you want to play with the software, it's open source on GitHub and you should, you should try that. And if you're interested in working on open source software, where we're taking a reinforcement learning approach to LLM systems and building LLM systems that learn from experience, check out our jobs page. Thank you so much.